Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak to any other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready to begin the presentation, press the Start Broadcast button on the GoToWebinar control panel to allow all attendees to hear you. This system will know Director for the Early Childhood Data Collaborative, and I'm going to be your host for today's webinar. Before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping items to review with everyone. Just to let you know, a recording of this webinar and a copy of the PowerPoint slides from the presentations will be available on the Early Childhood Data Collaborative website, and an email will be sent out to all those who registered after the materials are posted, so to let you know. Just due to the large number of people we have participating in the call today, all the attendees for the call are going to be muted. Uh, you can submit questions throughout the webinar using the question box located on your panel. Uh, and we will be responding to questions between presenters and then um, during a discussion session at the end of the call. The agenda for our webinar today will first begin with an overview of our new policy brief focused on the benefits, challenges, and strategies for linking Head Start data, and to share our recommended action steps based on what we learned. Next, you will hear from three states that are highlighted in the brief. You will learn more in detail about how states are linking from some or all of their Head Start grantees, how states are working with different state departments, and you'll get perspectives of states that are at different stages in the process. They will share what they have accomplished so far and their future plans. We will allow a few questions at the end of each presentation. And as I mentioned before, at the end of the webinar, we have time set aside for a discussion with all of the presenters. So please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation as they come to you. Uh, and we'll do, best, we'll do our best to get to all of them during the webinar. Before I introduce our first presenter, I just want to quickly share a bit about the Early Childhood Data Collaborative. The Collaborative is a partnership of seven national organizations. Our mission is to support state policymakers in the development and use of coordinated early care and education data systems. And this is really to focus on increasing children's access to high quality programs, using data to improve the quality of ECE programs, as well as address workforce development needs, and to ultimately ensure the positive development of our most vulnerable children. Our goal is to help state and policymakers transform data systems traditionally used to comply with funding and reporting requirements into systems that are improvement driven and can provide feedback that can be used to guide decision making and policies at all levels. Before I hand the presentation over to Tom, one of our ECDC partners, I would like to acknowledge and thank my fellow authors, the Head Start representatives we spoke with, all of the partners of the Early Childhood Data Collaborative, and the National Head Start Association for their support and input on this brief. I would also like to thank the Alliance for Early Success for their generous support of ECDC and this brief. Now I'd like to introduce Tom Schultz, Program Director for the Council of Chief State School Officers and one of our authors to give an overview of the Head Start brief. Tom will share why we focus on Head Start and what we learned from our conversations with Head Start leaders in 12 states. Tom? Thanks, Carlise. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, just to kind of start out with a picture of um, our vision for a coordinated state early childhood data system. Um, our view is that the challenge is to kind of connect data on children workforce and program quality and services from the different major funding streams that are supporting services to uh, birth to age five children, um, namely Head Start and Early Head Start, State Pre-K, Early Intervention and Preschool Special Education and Subsidized Child Care. 
and then in addition to linking those uh, data systems one with another to be able to move further and to connect those early childhood data with other major public services including elementary and secondary education, health and social services. And our goal in all of this is to help policymakers get a full picture of the early childhood services and workforce and the characteristics of young children in their states to kind of inform decisions that they make about finance and policy and also to equip early childhood agencies um, to understand the connections as families move from one funding source and type of agency to another and also transition into the public education system and other uh, public service systems. So um, given that vision, if we move to the next slide, um, in terms of understanding where states are at present, um, we did a 50-state survey in 2013 and found that about half of the states are linking data from at least a couple of their publicly funded early childhood programs um, to each other. Um, however, only one state in the country, uh, which was Pennsylvania, reported being able to link data across all of those major early care and education funding streams. Um, to go further in terms of breaking down um, what that distribution looked like, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that when we ask states which programs um, were, were um, currently um, linking data with another early childhood funding stream or with uh, public education data, we found that state pre-K and state and preschool special education programs um, were the programs that were most commonly linked uh, in terms of data systems. And data from federally funded Head Start and early um, Head Start programs were least likely to be linked um, in terms of what states reported to us in, in 2013. So um, that led us to think that a project to kind of look at this set of issues um, would, be, would be a fruitful thing to do. And based on the interviews that we did that Carlise mentioned with about 12 states, um, we learned quite a bit about um, the challenges and strategies for addressing this particular set of data linkage issues. So if you go to the next slide, um, I think we also thought that this initiative was important because if we aren't able to incorporate data on the services that Head Start's providing to young children, we really have a very incomplete picture of what early childhood data um, is, is um, available and, and what early childhood data systems can tell us about what's going on in the field. Um, as many of you on the call know, Head Start serves over a million low-income children. Um, they're all over the country in terms of uh, a network of local agencies, and they employ more than 230,000 staff members. So they, they are generating a lot of data on the characteristics of young children and represent a major part of our system of services for children birth to age five. Um, so th for that reason, it, it, we thought it was important to kind of delve into what are the particular challenges in linking data from these programs with other state early childhood data systems. And if you go to the next slide, um, as we'll hear from some of the uh, state partners that are going to share in a, in a few minutes, um, we found that, that three particular challenges um, are specific to um, Head Start data, particularly on federally funded children and, and families. One is that the system of, of managing data for Head Start differs from that of most other early care and education programs where um, data tends to flow from local agencies to state government um, in either human service, health, or education agencies. Uh, in the case of Head Start, reporting is done from local Head Start grantees to the Federal Office of Head Start in the Department of Health and Human Services, and they report aggregate data on many aspects of their program and their staff members and children, um, but there isn't a single data system um, in which all of that data is, is presently contained. Um, and the reason that is not the case is that 
local Head Start programs use a variety of different software systems to manage their data and comply with their federal federal reporting requirements. So um, these represent you know, real challenges when the goal is to figure out how to link the data that Head Start programs are creating um, with other data that is, um, for the most part, managed in a state system, in a state-based system. Um, nevertheless, we did find through several of the states that we talked to that um, there are some real success stories in a variety of, uh, in, in a variety of parts of the country um, where states are figuring out how to overcome these challenges. And if you go to the next few slides, we'll kind of give you an overview of some of the strategies um, that states are using in, in this regard. In terms of kind of what they're doing, um, the most common effort in terms of first steps has, has been linking data on Head Start children with data in their K-12 education data system so that public schools receive information on children who have been enrolled in Head Start. And similarly, Head Start programs, um, when data sharing agreements are negotiated, have the potential of getting feedback on um, the education experiences and accomplishments of their children in public education, which is a, you know, of great interest to a lot of Head Start programs. Um, the other two common strategies that are going on in a number of states are uh, participation by Head Start agencies in state-managed quality rating and improvement systems um, using common metrics and measures to generate information on program quality and also including Head Start staff in professional registry initiatives so that states are then able to have a picture of the quality that Head Start agencies are providing in serving federally funded children as well as the characteristics of Head Start teachers and other staff members in terms of their education experience and their career trajectories over time as they move, may move from one type of early childhood uh, job to another. Um, if we turn to the next slide in terms of how states are going about these efforts, um, what we found was that um, from the get-go, states are taking the initiative to engage Head Start leaders, their Head Start, state Head Start associations, their Head Start collaboration offices, and individual directors of programs in their planning efforts for their overall state early childhood data effort, whether through their early childhood advisory council, through an early, early learning challenge projects, um, or other types of, of state leadership efforts. Um, they're also creating ways of linking Head Start data through assigning unique ID numbers to children as they enroll in Head Start that can then be used um, by other state agencies and um, public education programs to track um, the experiences of Head Start kids. They're creating formal data sharing agreements with individual local Head Start grantees to spell out what types of data elements will be shared um, and to build in safeguards about the kinds of reports and, and access that will be provided for that data. And they're also creating ways to kind of upload data or share data from different software systems that Head Start programs are using to eliminate the requirement for Head Start programs to kind of do double entry of data in order to have it um, be included in, in other state data systems. So we'll hear more about some of these strategies from the folks that are going to talk in a few minutes. But just to wrap up um, my comments, in our issue brief, which will be available through the ECDC website following this webinar, um, we did provide some suggestions based on our interviews for actions by state and federal leaders um, to support more expansive linkage of Head Start data. And these are, I think, you know, probably pretty common sense to most of you folks on the um, on the webinar this afternoon. Um, you know, for to engage Head Start leaders in the data sharing effort, um, to be proactive in thinking through and addressing concerns about access to Head Start data and the forms of reporting that will be allowed and supported um, to 
encourage Head Start programs to participate in the QRIS and professional development registry initiatives, um, and then to provide supports as data is linked um, for Head Start programs and other partners um, to study and use data so that we can realize the potential of more fully coordinated data systems and deepen our understanding of what's going on for children and families um, and how early childhood programs and professionals are succeeding in the work that they do with children and families every day. Um, in terms of, of steps that we think the federal government can take, um, given the fact that both the Department of Education and HHS are involved in managing data and setting policies for data in terms of child care and Head Start within HHS, early childhood special education, the new preschool development grants and early learning challenge um, being managed in part through the Department of Education. Um, we think the Office of Head Start can certainly continue to encourage Head Start programs and their Head Start state collaboration offices to be engaged as full partners in state data efforts. Um, we think providing guidance on issues of data privacy and security is a key priority uh, and concern across the early childhood community and in public education generally these days. Um, and we think continuing work for Ed, for the Department of Ed and HHS to collaborate on issues of, of data linkage is also another strategy that would be helpful. So um, those are kind of the high points of our issue brief, which I encourage you to look at. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from the three uh, terrific state partners that are going to share with you in a minute. Uh, and that's, that's about it for me. So I think we may have time for a question or two if anybody has something that you'd like to pose for me, or else we can um, use that time towards the end of the broadcast. So thanks, Carlise. Thank you, Tom. We did have one question. Um, someone had asked, are there any states that are integrating data from state departments of public health to ensure that preventative health needs are met as part of early childhood development and school readiness? Right. It's, and that's a great question. And I, I think that um, the, the presentation this afternoon um, from from Katie in Utah is going to be an example of that um, because um, what the approach they've taken in terms of working with their Head Start data is to use their health data system as kind of like the, the warehouse or the foundation for that. So uh, hopefully she can talk about the advantages of that um, in terms of how, you know, linking the health data with Head Start data um, has some benefits. So thanks for that question. Okay, well thank you Tom. We have a few other questions, but we're going to, we'll save those until the end. Um, so please hold on and then we will, we're going to shift over to our next presenter. So as Tom mentioned, we found that states are approaching linking their child program and workforce Head Start data in different ways. Next, Karen Garver from New Jersey's Division of Early Education which is housed in the Department of Education, will share how they are planning to link Head Start data with their state longitudinal data system. Karen? Thanks so much, Carly. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, actually, I think we went forward a few too many. OK, great. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how New Jersey has included some Head Start data into our state longitudinal data system, which is called NJSMART. Um, we, we currently include child-level data for all preschoolers in our state-funded preschool programs. And our state-funded preschool program consists of a mixed delivery system where school districts serve children in district-operated classrooms, in contracted community provider classrooms, and also in contracted Head Start classrooms. So right now, all children included in the state-funded preschool program are also included in our SLDS NJSMART. Most children enter the system during registration in the summer months, but new records are entered on a rolling basis as children register and enroll in a preschool program. 
So new children may be enrolled in one of two different ways, depending on the school district's policy. Some districts have a centralized enrollment system where all children are registered and enrolled through a central office at the district and where their unique student identification number is assigned. Other districts allow for registration uh, at the site level. In this case, uh, families register their child at the site they wish to attend, and then their registration forms are ultimately batched together and delivered to the district for formal enrollment and assignment of the child's unique identification number. The bulk of this does happen during the summer months, but of course new children are registered and enrolled on a rolling basis throughout the school year. And then snapshot data is taken uh, twice a year, once on October 15th and once uh, at the end of the year on June 30th. Next slide. So uh, aside from the, the unique student identification number, we also use a site level identification number to track which program a child attends. Every program site has its own unique nine digit code and it's the district's responsibility to ensure that each child is recorded as having attended the correct program site. We have a two-digit code uh, within the nine-digit code. There's a, a two-digit code for every county in the state and a four-digit code for every school district within each county. And then within each school district, there's a three-digit code for every site. The Early Childhood Office here at the New Jersey Department of Education uh, assigns and keeps track of those three-digit site level codes. And that's actually one of our biggest challenges. On an annual basis, our office collects data on the number of, of classrooms projected at every preschool site and in every school district. Um, any, any new sites that appear are assigned a three-digit code that's then communicated to our NJ Smart vendors. When a site is no longer being used, that three-digit code is then retired indefinitely so that no other site within the same school district will ever have the same three-digit code. Sometimes changes happen mid-year, in which case we can then add or drop sites as we need to with our NJ Smart vendor. But the challenge is that we find that sites um, shift a fair amount from year to year, so making sure that school districts keep us abreast of those changes uh, is something that we try to keep on top of as best we can. More often than not, we find out about those changes when districts call in a panic because they don't have a code for a new site that, uh, that's being used within the district. And the districts know that their state funding is dependent upon the actual site level enrollment numbers they submit within NJ Smart. So there's definitely an incentive for them to ensure that their, uh, that their sites and their site codes are accurate and helps us to, uh, to keep them on track with those. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we are able to include uh, some Head Start information within our NJ Smart system. Right now, uh, NJ Smart only includes data for Head Start children who are in state-funded preschool classrooms. Some of those classrooms are funded with a blend of state and federal funding, and others uh, in a few cases are funded solely with state funding. But the bottom line is that we're not collecting data yet in NJ Smart for any Head Start children who aren't served within our state-funded preschool program. So that means we're missing all infants and toddlers and any Head Start preschoolers who are uh, within programs outside of our state-funded program. But we're currently trying to take some, uh, some steps to remedy that issue. The next slide um, addresses some of the approaches we're taking. So in an effort to include more of our Head Start children in NJ Smart, we started having conversations with our state Head Start collaboration director. And she's been wonderful in helping us in meetings with our NJ Smart vendor to explain the unique nature of Head Start programs and their data, and uh, was also responsible for establishing a connection between our state's Head Start office here at the Department of Education and our New Jersey Head Start Directors Association. And that Directors Association even established a small work group to discuss what it might look like for them uh, to share more of their Head Start data with our NJ Smart system. In the meantime, uh, we met separately with our NJ Smart office to discuss uh, what we bring to the table in our conversations with the Head Start agencies. So in other words, what's in it for them? Um, and thanks to, thanks to some great advice we received from um, our colleagues in Colorado, 
we started to, uh, having conversations about how to develop some crosswalks between NJ Smart and the data systems that are used by Head Start agencies to collect their student level information, um, similar to what Tom had mentioned um, in his presentation uh, that, that a lot of different states are trying to do right now. And our, our goal ultimately is to make it as painless as possible for Head Start agencies to link their data with ours. Uh, but we're also trying to think about what we can provide in return, um, what kinds of output we can return back to the Head Start agencies. Most specifically, we're thinking about um, what kinds of kindergarten entry assessment information uh, we can report back to the Head Start agencies so that they can, um, they can have a good sense of the impact that they're having, uh, of the efficacy of their, of their program on uh, the children who, who've attended. Um, and one of the other approaches that we're hoping to take is to identify one Head Start agency to uh, kind of be our guinea pig and do a, guest, uh, a test run for uh, including their data in NJ Smart, and then in turn become a trusted partner that we can use uh, with the other Head Start agencies um, to build some trust throughout the Head Start community regarding uh, the safety of their data and um, and just the process of them including their information in our in our longitudinal data system. So next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're able to do with the Head Start information that we already collect within our NJ Smart system, and the the best example of that is really. Um, our APPLE study. It's our uh, Abbott Preschool Program Longitudinal Effects Study. And uh, so a longitudinal study uh, that is, has been conducted for us through uh, the National Institute for Early Education Research out of Rutgers University. And um, they, our agreement with Rutgers started in 2004-2005 um, to do a longitudinal out evaluation of child outcomes. Um, looking at four-year-olds who attended the program in the 2004-2005 uh, uh, school year. And the most recent report uh, that NEAR conducted for us uh, was completed in 2013, uh, where they were able to look at fourth and fifth grade results of students uh, from the um, or 405 school year. And NEAR was able to successfully match about 70% of the original sample size from uh, from the study, which uh, we were really excited about. They were able to, um, to follow that high level of, of students over time. And that includes students in Head Start programs as well. And the study was able to document um, some sustained impact of the state-funded preschool program on children who, uh, who attended for one year and then uh, even larger impacts for children who attended for two years. Uh, so we're really excited about the work uh, that NEAR has been able to do for us and um, the outcomes that we've been able to show of, uh, of children across different settings within our state-funded preschool program. So that's how we're able to use our linked Head Start data right now. And um, in the next slide, I just wanted to talk for a minute about some of our plans for the future. So um, this is a... a great graphical depiction of uh, the early childhood integrated data system that New Jersey is in the process of developing. And we're looking to try to pull together data on the child, family, classroom, program, and workforce level um, across data systems in four different state agencies. So the graphic is showing all of the different state agencies that are involved and the different data systems that, uh, that are housed within those state agencies that we're hoping to pull um, this child level and family level and classroom level information into one integrated data system so that we can answer some questions that we can't already answer with individual data systems. And um, as Tom had mentioned, we, um, we do have Head Start information in NJ Smart, our, our Department of Education longitudinal data system, and we're hoping to include more Head Start information in that data system. But as you can see in this, um, in this graphic, we're also hoping to get Head Start information through some of our other state data systems. For example, um, our, uh, our Grow NJ Kids data system, which is our QRIS data system. Um, and also any Head Start information that might be collected through our licensing system, 
um, and through our, our workforce registry. So hopefully we'll be um, getting Head Start data integrated into, um, into other systems in a variety of different ways um, moving forward. And I think some of my colleagues from uh, the other states coming up probably have some, um, some, some tactics uh, that they're using um, related to that that, are, that have been successful that I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, to be able to use in our, in our future work as well. Uh, so that's all I have on New Jersey's end of things. I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has. Thank you so much, Karen. We do have a few questions. I think one I'll follow up because you just mentioned it. Someone had asked about early learning programs that are in QRES but are not in school district. Um, is there child-specific data collected from non-school district run programs? Uh, within our um, state data system, no. Uh, there only, well, I think it, it depends on how, how the question is asked, I guess. So if there, we have child-level data um, in our SLDS for programs that are within our state-funded preschool program. So if it's a contracted community provider outside of a school district building, then yes, and, and in a Head Start building, um, yes, we have child-level information on those children. Um, but if it's outside of our state-funded program, then we don't uh, have have state uh, have child-level information. Karen, we had a few questions um, from attendees, just wanting some clarification about how Head Start children are identified in the state longitudinal data system. Sure. Specifically, um, at the child level, is there a funding code for Head Start only children, and are you are they broken out as subgroups as analysis? At any sure. Time? So, um, so really, it's a combination of two things that we use to be able to identify um, how a child is served and where. So, the the unique child ID um, is used, but it's really it's really the site level um, ID that's used. So, if a program has a purely state funded, even if it's a Head Start program, um, we do have a few situations where. We have Head Start programs that have um, different class classrooms that are funded in different ways. So we might have a Head Start program that has a site with purely state funded uh, classrooms and then another site with state and Head Start funded classrooms. So each of those sites would have a different code and we'd be able to track that way um, what type of a program each child was in. So, the NJ Smart system will link the individual child record to the site where that child attended the preschool program. Um, and then we're able to disaggregate information so that we can look at um, child level information by the type of site um, that children attended for preschool. Okay, and we have a couple more, but I'm just going to give you one more question before we move on. Okay. So have agents the question for you, one was, great job, thank you. <laughs> uh, have agencies developed a common set of child and or family data to avoid having families repeat information each time an application is completed for different services? Uh, so I think uh, the answer probably, it depends a little bit. We do have um, some school districts that have streamlined the process um, in a centralized registration system, and I know that they communicate with the Head Start agencies they're working with to try to streamline the paperwork that families are filling out so that they're not um, filling out multiple pieces of information um, over and over again. Um, and in those cases, generally, the family goes to the Head Start agency, they fill out one set of information, and then that information is, um, is then transferred over to the school district for um, entry into the NJ Smart system. Um, it's a little less streamlined in the school districts where they have um, where they have site level uh, sort of a, a it's a it's a slight, slightly different process in some of our our school districts. So I, I think the answer is um, in some school districts yes, and in some school districts no. Um, it's done a little bit better <laughs> by some than others. Um, and actually, the that question um, it, it's actually a really good question and and something that. Um, I think I'll probably tuck away to use to go back to some of the school districts that aren't doing it well to kind of nudge them uh, to try to streamline that process a little better and use some of their uh, some of the other school districts that are doing it well as a, a model for how to do it moving forward. 
All right. Well, Karen, thank you so much. We have several other questions. Thank you, guys. Please keep them coming. Um, we'll save them um, and address them during our discussion period. So we're going to move on to our next presenter. So hello, next. everyone. Oh, this Katie. is Katie Richard calling from Utah, and I'm really happy to be a part of this presentation today. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me on the line. Please let me know, um, Carly, if this, I can't be heard. So I've had the privilege to be part of this comprehensive data system that Utah has developed from the beginning. And my role in that um, initially was I was the tri-chair director of the Utah Head Start Association. And we were invited to come to the table to talk about the system as it was first being um, discussed and, and developed. And so from the very beginning, I was part of the planning and discussions and the main person who were communicating for the Head Start program and sharing information with all the Head Start programs in my role as that association tri-chair director. And then I moved into the state role of the Head Start Collaboration Office Director and continued my work there um, with the committee and had a deeper level of um, uh, buy-in to the program and ensuring all of our Head Start programs in the state were represented as part of that. I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through the presentation. So the next slide just gives a brief overview um, of some of the questions that our comprehensive system um, hopefully will be answering for us in a clear picture. These are some of the general questions we want to know uh, at any point in time, or at least on an annual report basis for um, legislative and other uh, sharing opportunities, what's the unduplicated count of children in Utah, 0 to 5, and then how many of those children receive services, how many of those children receive multiple services from different programs. Uh, to go to the next slide, uh, of the children who receive multiple um, services from their varying programs, what's the crossover count, and do any of those children follow a certain sequence of each services, is there a sequential order for them receiving services? For example, does a child start in our Help Me Grow program and then from there move to home visiting and then from there to early intervention or early head start or something else? And there are some deeper level, long-term goals that our comprehensive system um, uh, is trying to answer, which includes things such as our children birth to five on track to succeed when they enter school, and what are the educational and economic returns on early childhood investments. So we have a set of long-term questions that we hope to be able to achieve as we work towards um, improving and streamlining learning the data in this system. So the next slide talks about how we have worked to engage Head Start um, in Utah. In Head Start, we've got 12 grantees, and as of right now, nine of the 12 grantees have signed data sharing agreements and are actively involved in this data sharing process. Um, in our, up to the phase that we're currently at. And we are in the middle of phase one. We'll be ending um, this spring as we uh, pull our first set of data reports that will enter phase two. So it all started with our early childhood comprehensive um, systems grant that we received. Our Department of Health received that grant. And uh, kind of the mechanism we have in Utah for our state advisory council, which is called Early Childhood Utah, um, some of the pieces and key players in Early Childhood Utah kind of helped set the structure for this Early Childhood Comprehensive Data System. And so our Department of Health data system is called CHARM, and the CHARM data system is separate from our Early Childhood Comprehensive Data System, but it feeds its um, health data on the children in Utah into the data system. Um, some examples of pieces of information in this system are immunizations and Part C, early intervention, and um, other other partners. And um, and then our involved Head Start grantees, of course, there's nine of the 12. And from the very beginning, each Head Start grantee was invited to have 
a couple of representatives on the actual data committee who helped with the planning and um, formulating the questions and, and the safeguards and bringing up the risks and concerns of the Head Start program. And while not all grantees were able to participate because of their location and availability of staff, um, my role was to communicate back to all the programs through our state Head Start director group and the Head Start Association, all of the information from these planning committees um, to ensure all grantees were up to speed and had the opportunity to have full buy-in. And as you can see here, um, talks about committee structures. There are active committees uh, on the systems grants project. One of them is a policy committee whose role is to develop policies that will protect the data that is in our system. And then we have a research committee, and their purpose is to manage all of the requests for data. That would include the requests from the actual participating programs sharing the data, and then any outside requests that come from researchers, higher ed, legislative, and other. And um, Head Start grantees who are a part of the system and contributing data have the right to have a representative on each of the active committees to ensure data is being used effectively and appropriately um, in all aspects of, of its use. So the next slide gives you a picture of this system. Um, it looks a little bit complicated, so I'm going to try to walk you through it as clearly as I can. So on the left side of the screen, you see all of those green boxes. These are all of the partners who have, from the beginning, been at the table in planning this data system and have participated on those committees we talked about just previously. Um, and so the lines that go to that um, green circle with the X through it, that green circle represents real-time continuous data integration. So that is the place where all of the data is coming to initially from the system. So that includes Head Start data, um, our early intervention people, the health department's data, office and visiting, foster care. That is where all this information goes initially. And the purpose of that coming together, um, uh, there are several purposes. One, of course, is to match records to see if this little Johnny over here is the same as this Johnny over here with the same phone number and try to figure out um, try to make sure that each child who's in there maybe five times because of all the services they've received is um, being accounted for in each of the systems. And so records are matched, they're checked for duplicate entries. In here, um, the, the children in here are also being assigned a unique identifier. And I'll talk a little bit about how that's been a difficult process and will continue to be for a little while. But they'll get a unique identifier here, which will be their school ID number going forward. And then um, once everyone is matched up and assigned their unique identifier, then all of their identifying information is stripped away from them. The technical term is they're de-identified. And then they are pushed into the green cylinder in the center, which is called the Early Childhood Data System. So this is where the de-identified um, information is stored and where um, we can get snapshots and pictures of the children in the state of Utah and uh, be able to filter information here for any data requests and reports that we need to do. Now, I think it's important to mention here that um, the information in this cylinder will only be shared with anybody at an aggregate level, um, and that's uh, at the request of protection of uh, those children and families in this system, and that was one of the conditions of Head Start programs being part of, of this program. Um, and then once, this, once the uh, information is in that comprehensive data system, when children leave Earth, their early childhood, age group and they move to public, the public school system. Um, the blue circle with the X in it is where their information goes. It's re-identified to make sure all records are matched up to each child accordingly. And then they're de-identified again before they're pushed into the Utah Data Alliance, which is where, where all the public um, 
data is, is saved for our school and beyond. So that's a little bit tricky, but hopefully um, it makes sense, um, at least on a basic level. So um, the next slide talks about uh, how we address Head Start concerns. And so as I mentioned from the beginning, each grantee who was participating had the right to have representation on our committee work and to bring um, their concerns to the table. And some of those concerns included programs having to create a new parent enrollment form that would allow parents, that would inform parents of this data opportunity and what would happen if they didn't want their child to participate. And that was the responsibility of each program to figure out. Um, another concern was uh, the identification of child information, making sure not any child can be recognized by um, anyone of consider considerable intelligence. And so um, the data um, ability to pull only aggregate information on, on groups of children does help resolve those two concerns. And each program is also taking the initiative to inform their, their families about the system and, and do what they need to um, in order to get their participation. They also had a concern about uh, how the data was going to be used, the information in the system. They wanted to ensure that um, their information was being compared or shared or classified in ways that made sense. And it was like comparing apples to apples um, so that there wasn't any misconstrued representation of their information. And then another concern was the development of our data sharing agreement, which was a really long process um, that we were able to, through a lot of hard work from the Head Start and other program representation and our legal representatives, we were able to create a data sharing agreement um, that is both FERPA and HIPAA compliant um, that addresses, addresses any of those concerns. And so all of our Head Start grantees, the nine of the 12 who have signed those data sharing agreements, will be part of their first wave of data entry into the system. Uh, the next slide talks a little bit about some of the technical challenges of this project. Um, the first one is identifying and selecting appropriate data from all the sources at meaningful points in time. Basically, it's like getting a snapshot of a child and being able to share what's in that snapshot in a relevant way. Another technical challenge is monitoring all of the data sources for the new and changing data that's coming into the system. And also gathering and correlating person data for multiple programs. And that was mentioned, I think, in the New Jersey presentation. Um, all of the Head Start programs use different systems to collect data, and some of them use multiple systems. And all of those Head Start systems differ very greatly from all of the other early childhood programs in the state. And so figuring out how to correlate all of those data systems is, has been a trick. Um, the next slide talks about a couple of other challenges. Um, assigning and managing unique identifiers. Every program um, tracks kiddos differently. Some programs use social security numbers. Head Start generally does not use social security numbers just because we serve the neediest of the needy, which may include children who don't have those numbers. Um, and so figuring out a way to create a unique, unique identifier for those kiddos was an internal challenge. And then ensuring that only our early childhood comprehensive system um, people have access to the actual de identifiable data. So the next slide talks about some of the benefits for Head Start programs. So Head Start programs, of course, will receive information, um, services information for children. We are also working on um, community assessment information. So right now, I think I mentioned earlier, we are just in the middle of the conclusion of phase one. And um, that will end this spring with the sharing of the first round of reporting. And that first round in phase one does not include actual Head Start data because of the complications of um, bringing their different data systems together to read into the early childhood data system. And so the initial phase one data just includes 
um, all of the Department of Health data, um, immunizations and vital statistics, the Office of Home Visiting, and they have the data housed in the Department of Health as part of that first initial round of reporting. They too will include all of the Head Start programs um, and a couple of the other partners um, coming in, uh, Help Me Grow, and I think Foster Care, and they'll be part of Phase 2. And um, in Phase 2, the Head Start programs are working with the data people to have meaningful information that they can pull that will help with their community assessment reports. And also data that will help support advocacy at both the local community level and at a statewide level. So uh, my final slide talks about a couple of next steps. Of course, um, I think for all of us, this investment, um, we want to be able to show the longitudinal outcome on our children and how our services are helping those children be successful for school and those families um, for life. And so um, phase, uh, phase three of our system, we're working on how we can incorporate um, child assessment information. Um, and some of that might even happen in phase two, depending on the programs, but most likely not for our Head Start programs. Um, so we want to include the child assessment data and then be able to show longitudinal outcomes. The nice thing about our data system is when programs start entering their child information, it's not going to be just from their current children. And anything they have electronically from past years can also be entered into this system. And so it is the expectation that when we're able to start pulling reports um, on the Head Start kidders, those who have um, several years' worth of electronic data will be able to see those kiddos from five, maybe even ten years ago, and where they're at in the school system. Um, and so those are some things that we're looking forward to in different phases in this project. So that is the conclusion of my slides. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take a couple of them. Thank you so much, Katie. That was great. Um, we got quite a few questions, um, so I'm going to try to just um, quickly do some of the clarifying questions. Um, someone had asked, um, when you discuss the 12 grantees in Utah, does that include tribal Head Start programs? It does include Tribal Head Start programs, and our Tribal Head Start program, we have one. And um, they are on board. They were still waiting, though, for their Tribal Council to actually sign the data sharing agreement. So once that is officially signed by the Tribal Council, we'll have 10 of our 12 programs on board. So the actual Head Start um, tribe is on board. They're just waiting for the actual Tribal um, sign-off. And then um, you had mentioned re-identifying data after it had been de-identified. Uh, someone had asked a clarification on that. OK, so um, when um, early childhood data enters the, the, the storage place for that and it's um, matched up, given its unique identifier, and then pushed into the actual early childhood data system, it is not identifiable there. So once those kiddos turn five or sometimes six and they move, from early childhood into the public school system, which on that one slide that had all the pictures on it, it was the blue circle with the X, it becomes re-identifiable just for a brief snapshot of time to ensure um, it can be rematched with the other entries into the system. And the purpose of that is to capture children who maybe have moved out of the state while they were in the childhood system and moved back into the state in their elementary or, or older years to make sure that it's the same child that we're looking at and not a different child. So it's just a brief moment in time where it's identifiable just to ensure they're looking at the same or different kiddos and then it's de-identified and pushed into the um, Utah Data Alliance system. So hopefully that makes sense. And then one more um, question. Can the system support health screening results and follow-up care after a referral? Could you say that question one more time? Uh, someone had asked if the system could support in collecting information around health screening results and any follow-up to care after a referral. OK. So to my knowledge, that is not part of our phase one information, but it could be part of future phases um, and the reports that are shared. Uh, we, 
So I, the answer is I don't know, but um, the great thing about the Utah system is that as we go through each phase, we have the opportunity to look at what the reports are showing us and if it's giving us the answers we want, the questions like that one, and how can we um, reframe how we're looking at the data or do extra work to get what we need out of it to answer those questions. So um, that's the best that I can do to answer that question. No, that's great. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, we're still holding on to them. Um, and we'll, we have about 20 minutes at the end for our discussion. So next slide. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Janice as our last state presenter. She serves as the director of the Head Start State Collaboration Office in Georgia. Georgia has engaged in an extensive data planning process and has been able to obtain 100% participation mm -hmm. from grant, Head Start grantees to link data. Uh, Janice will share with us how they did it. Janice? Uh, thank you, Carlise. If you'll go to the next slide. Okay, I want to, rather than go into more technical aspects of the Georgia data system, I'm going to concentrate on the process uh, that uh, Georgia went through in order to get buy-in from all the state agencies, including Head Start. Um, early on, there was a meeting uh, with state agencies and getting ready for the funding for the state advisory councils. And um, in, in this meeting, uh, priorities were identified. And so about a year before uh, Georgie even proposed for funding for this, uh, priorities were identified. And one, of course, was the unified uh, data sharing uh, system for Georgia. So once uh, they realized, and uh, th of course, that everyone has a stake in this effort, that, and, and Georgia also established its purpose for data sharing. And um, we, di we the discussion was about who would benefit from the data, uh, the data system, and what data points uh, were needed so that sharing could begin. So, if you'll um, turn to the next slide. I should say that the uh, Head Start Collaboration Office is seated in the Department of Early Care and Learning in Georgia. And uh, that is the department that's separate from education that ha deals with all the services for uh, early childhood and early childhood development in the state. So before 2010, when the State Advisory Council, or pre-council, I should say, met, the Georgia Head Start Association in their strategic plan uh, identified a need to gather more data regarding child outcomes and to show how well Head Start was doing in Georgia uh, as they transition into school. Um, so. The cost of getting this data was prohibited, and there were differences in the assessment tools, as both uh, Katie and, and Karen had, had mentioned. So um, in 2008, the uh, preliminary met uh, for the State Advisory Council, and in this were included the Head Start State uh, Collaboration Office, as well as the Georgia Head Start Association. This committee included all of those uh, required members plus some who would be uh, in the State Advisory Council. Next slide, please. So during that time of the discussions with the State Advisory Council on the data system, there were discussions that went on with the Head Start Association regarding the benefits uh, of the system and, and how the association and Head Start could use that information. And I'll go through that in the next couple of slides. So the State Advisory Council began to plan to implement the system, and that included an interface with the system used by the Department of Edu Education called Georgia Awards, and that included, uh, as everybody else had said, the uh, assigning a unique identifier to every child in the program. Next slide, please. So what 
the benefits that uh, the Georgia Head Start Association realized is that this would give them the ability to track child outcomes and that they could use this outcome data to improve program quality. For example, uh, how is that child that we had in Head Start doing in the third grade and what does this tell us about our program and what we need to, uh, how we need to up the ante in certain areas. Um, uh, information would be accessible for teachers when children transition from public schools to inform instruction, and this, of course, is part of uh, the Head Start priorities. Uh, the Department of Public Health and, and Medicaid Information and other services are, would be part of uh, this whole data system, and actually MOUs have been signed with them. And Another use uh, or benefit would be avoiding the replication of screenings and other data and services for Head Start children that had already gone through screenings. And that would even be um, going from one program to the next. Next slide, please. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we were able to get 100% participation for the grantees in Georgia, and that is 30 Head Start and Early Head Start grantees and, and, and one migrant seasonal program, so all are participating. And that started with the initial communication with the Georgia Head Start Association, having the Department of Early Care and Learning, who took the lead on uh, this project, to uh, give workshops and presentations at their meeting. Uh, then an additional um, communication was, uh, was given uh, to all grantees throughout the process. And so we made a lot of visits, uh, both the commissioner of the department as well as our uh, IT guru, Craig Dittweiler, to explain how the system would work. Um, there were some uh, concerns with grantee boards, and so we communicated with uh, boards in addition to explain some of the security and, um, and other information that they were a little bit reluctant to, to share. Uh, and, and next was that the grantees shared a data sharing agreement uh, with the um, Department of Early Care and Learning and with Child Plus. Child Plus is the software that all but two Head Start programs uh, use in Georgia. So that made it uh, very easy. So we have a memorandum of agreement from the Department of Early Care and Learning bet um, between the grantees and also with Child Plus to give uh, so that they have um, authorization to input uh, Child Plus Head Start information into the system. Parents signed uh, authorization at enrollment, and as I think both um, Karen and Katie said, uh, some enrollment applications needed to be uh, changed at that time. Um, data is downloaded from Child Plus biannually, and uh, right now we're going through our first revision of downloads, and uh, it is sent back to the grantee where it needs to be cleaned up. Next slide, please. So the system had uh, several priorities, and the first one was the easiest, and that was that uh, the system included first the Georgia state-funded pre-K program for four-year-olds, and they were first assigned those unique identifiers. Uh, then Head Start and Early Head Start both are assigned those numbers. So that is in process already. The other thing that will be coming next would be uh, giving unique identifiers to those programs who are quality rated and also those who are quality rated in uh, both child care and, uh, and family child care situations. And then our uh, private preschool uh, centers and families. Uh, I should say also that there are uh, right now 17 data points that were agreed upon for all agencies uh, on what the system would include. Next slide, please. 
So I'm going to talk of some about the challenges, and that was getting parent permission uh, to use the, the data and for their child to be assigned a number. And um, the parent, again, signs the authorization form upon enrollment. They have an option where they can opt out. And so uh, by just checking a box and putting their signature on it, their child does not become a part of the, uh, of the process, uh, and their data cannot be aggregated. So that's not uh, downloaded from that time. We hope as it goes on and as um, parents become more comfortable with the situation because they uh, have talked with staff and staff understands the importance of, uh, going, of giving permission to use this, uh, that more parents will give their permission for their child to be in that database. Um, the other challenge was that um, there was a real uh, worry that security measures were being followed. And so the department held information sessions sessions with Head Start directors as well as board members regarding the security of the system and the fact that only aggregate data uh, would be used. And of course, uh, compliance with FERPA, and that had to do with signing uh, all the uh, guidance information at the beginning of the school year. And the last was, as everybody can imagine, it's uh, cleaning the data. Uh, and, and basically, it's misspelling or not everything is entered in the format uh, that it was supposed to be entered, or maybe there's a change in how the birth date was entered. So we're just really working through some of those small minutia uh, of that, um, that seems to arise whenever you do, I call it, data, data entry error. Um, Next step, the other challenge uh, that we had was that assessment data, as everywhere, is different, and people use different assessment data. And this was one big problem identified by the Georgia Head Start Association uh, earlier on, and how can we compare, since we all use different assessment data, how can we give any kind of standard um, information on how children are going to be uh, assessed or what the assessment reveals. Um, the good thing about Georgia is it aligned the Georgia Early Learning Standards uh, most recently and uh, used the Head Start framework. So it's aligned to the Head Start framework. And we can now look at how we relate that uh, Georgia Early Learning Standards to each of the different uh, assessment data. And so that's being worked on right now about how we add uh, the assessment information. Uh, another big problem, as you heard before, was to develop policies regarding data access. Um, for example, how do we communicate with different agencies and different uh, levels of information at different levels? who gets what information and what are the policies and concerns. And so all agencies are part of that policy development, which is uh, a rather lengthy process, and, and it needs to be a lengthy process. So we don't jump the gun and uh, do something before we're ready. Uh, the migrant program was reluctant to uh, share some information, especially uh, addresses. And so one way around that is that the migrant program does not enter uh, the address of children into the program. And so I, I guess the, the thing to take from here is that Georgia benefited from ongoing communication. And uh, we probably, in, in many cases, overdid uh, how we communicated. But it was very valuable. Uh, for that buy-in, and uh, we're, we're thrilled that we have 100% of our Head Start grantees uh, that are part of this process. And, and most recently, uh, the Department of Early Care and Learning was awarded uh, an Early Head Start Child Care Partnership grant, so they will be signing 
uh, uh, those uh, MOUs and those data sharing agreements as well, and we'll be using uh, Child Plus. So it, it really benefits everyone to uh, to talk and 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 to really look at what we all gain from the process. And that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, we have several questions. So uh, first, Janice, I'm going to give I'm going to go through. A few specific questions just for your presentation, and then we'll open it up for the general discussion. Okay. So we had several um, attendees that wanted to get a sense of, if you know, how many parents opted out of providing their child's data. I don't know an amount, but it is not a terrible amount. It's, it's a few per, um, per, per grantee. So for the most part, they were happy to do that. And um, someone else had asked, how many grantees are there in Georgia? Um, and specifically, how does that impact the two that you mentioned that do not use Child Plus? OK, there are 31 grantees in Georgia. That includes a migrant seasonal program. We found uh, another way that we could download the information from those other two by um, using some secure Excel spreadsheet work in that. And I, I'm not sure of the technicalities, but we were able to, to also download that information. Um, and someone else had asked about whether there is a state license for programs for Child Plus, or are they within each of the individual grantees? Oh, it's with each individual grantee. Okay. And then the last question before I open up to more of the general questions, which I think apply across the state presenters, um, is is the Georgia a, a system a case management system versus, or is it more of a historical review and reporting system? I think it. What the intent would be to be eventually both, so that we could work with what we know historically happens, as well as to manage those cases. And, and one thing that I did forget to say, one of the plans, uh, the plan for the future is, is that parents would be able to download information on their children uh, from a certain set point, and that um, they wouldn't have to keep reentering data time and time again. So uh, from that standpoint, I see that as the case management part. Okay, so we have um, we have some time to go to some of the general questions that we had. So I'm just going to um, give some of the overall questions and have each of the state representatives respond to them. So one question that we got repeatedly is that for each of your different systems, um, do you have a method for tracking attendance, um, which would allow you to look at dosage issues? So I'll start with Karen. Um, yes, we do. Uh, the uh, the private, the contracted Head Start and, and other community providers do um, on a monthly basis report attendance to the school districts, which is then incorporated into the um, the state longitudinal data system, along with that same information for children who are in um, district operated classrooms. Okay, Katie. No, we do not. Um, that could be something that we add in the future. But as of right now, unless it's part of the standard program information we're collecting, it will not be part of the data system. And Janice? Uh, we do not have that uh, element in our data system yet. However, by using Child Plus, we have that data for Head Start and are using it to monitor dosage. But again, it's not part of this system yet. And here's a quick yes or no question. Um, would you be able to share any of your MOUs or data sharing agreements with those that are interested? Janet? Yes. Katie? Absolutely. And Karen? 
So we actually don't have uh, MOUs or data sharing agreements because the children are all part of our state-funded preschool program. So it's just it's sort of a matter of fact that the data gets pulled in. Okay. I would share them and add them. <laughs> <laughs> And this one, I'm going to start with Katie, um, but I expanded out to the other presenters as well. Um, the question was, how can researchers, because I think Katie, you mentioned specifically a portal for researchers. What is the process for researchers accessing um, information in your system? That is a great question. So they will have to apply um, with uh, what their research is um, about. We haven't done this yet. We're going to start it, though, um, probably in phase two. So they'll have to apply in order to um, submit their project, the research project. And um, I don't know what that's going to look like yet because it hasn't been created. But once it's been, um, they've applied for and submitted the request, it'll go to the research management committee, who will then review and um, do their own research to ensure um, the safety of the information, and then they will give the um, consent to approve or to or um, disapprove the um, request, and um, then we'll go from there. But it hasn't been created yet. So. Okay, and then Karen, is there is there a process for researchers to access the data that you guys have? There is, um, and it's actually a, a fairly strict process uh, where. Um, generally, researchers uh, would go through an, an IRB process and then make a presentation to our NJ Smart office to use um, any NJ Smart data. And then, um, as is with the case with our, um, it was a little bit different for our state longitudinal uh, preschool study because it was something that that uh, the state Department of Education was involved in um, commissioning in the first place. So in that case, um, we have a, an MOU with Rutgers um, to have access to specific information to track children over time. And this is Katie. And ours will have to go through the IRB process as well. And we do have um, a higher education, education researcher on our research committee. So. And Janice, have you de has your system well, developed? That's part of the policies that are under development at this time. Okay, and then next, um, they, I know you guys have all talked about the benefits, but could you give sort of a short summary of what, if if any, what types of incentives are offered were offered to Head Start um, as part of your process or plan to um, to get their engagement, and how were the benefits explained to them? Janice, we'll start with you. Um, I think in, in George's case, the Head Start saw the benefits uh, of having the unified data system up front and the value of being able to pull information about school readiness and child outcomes uh, right from the start. And um, there were no monetary incentives except for the fact that uh, in the race to the top, the funding uh, paid for the um, consolidation of some of this uh, information, like downloading from Child Plus and assigning the unique identifier. So Head Start did not have to uh, pay for that information, and that they will be able to be privy to information that they need once policies are developed. Thank you. And Katie, can you answer the same question about incentives, but also um, another question was, for your system, how, how was that funded, the process funded for you? So Utah's um, development of the system was funded through um, an Early Childhood Comprehensive Systems grant. And so any program that um, was part of it from the get-go has had no cost to them to be part of, to be part of this whole process. Um, and so any of our Head Start programs who did not participate or sign agreements during that grant period, they can still join the system, but they'll have to pay a fee to get their um, data um, information on the system, as well as anyone else who joins after. Um, now moving forward, because the grant is gone, we're looking at ways that we can continue funding the system. And so we don't know what that's going to look like yet. 
but other incentives, of course, is the um, future um, uh, having the, the longitudinal school readiness um, and outcome data for their, their programs. Um, and a special uh, incentive that has not yet been um, uh, grabbed by anybody, per se, is um, in Utah, most of our Head Start programs use Child Plus, but not all of them do. And so there is a potential opportunity for them to have the funding for them to switch to Child Plus paid for um, through a special grant that, um, that um, Utah currently has. But um, to date, nobody has done that. So. OK, thank you. And Karen? So uh, there were no incentives for um, pulling Head Start data into our um, NJ Smart system, because again, just because there it was part of our state-funded preschool program. Um, and, and NJ Smart is funded by, uh, it's, it's state-funded, um, entirely state-funded. Um, but then moving forward and trying to pull additional non-state preschool Head Start children into our um, SLDS, um, we're looking at sort of similar to what um, Janice um, had mentioned, that we're finding that the Head Start agencies are, are seeing the benefit of participating and being able to get outcome information back from the system. So there hasn't been a, a demand for additional incentives, at least not so far. But we're not all that far along in that process yet. So we may find that that comes up um, moving forward. Um, and then in terms of our early childhood integrated data system um, and any additional Head Start information we're supposed to bring in that way, um, the, our ECIDS is um, right now being funded solely through our Race of the Top Early Learning Challenge grant. Um, so, and we're also looking for ways to keep that um, sustained post-grant. OK, and this was, um, we've had several of our attendees are interested in whether any of the presenters are able to connect screening data. So if, people, if anyone is currently including screening data as part of their linking process, can they just um, tell us a little bit about that? Is anyone? Uh, and this is Katie. Um, this is Katie from Utah. We are not doing that, but that'll be part of, I think, phase two. Um, and yeah, so no, we're not doing that yet. Uh, this is Janice. Uh, we are not doing it yet, but there are plans to do that. So uh, New Jersey is not at this time, but we're hoping to uh, at some point in the future. OK, and then we had several questions about the MOU and the data sharing agreement process. Um, I know several people mentioned that it was a lengthy pro process and as a challenge. Um, people had wanted to get a sense of what specifically were the challenges that you encountered in developing the data sharing agreement. Janice? Um, actually, developing the agreement was not a, uh, a real challenge. Um, it's about a, a one and a half page agreement that states what everybody is going to do and what the um, what the data would be used for. And it talked about the security of the system as well as the aggregate data. And so it, it was basically a very simple process. Uh, you know, going through the Head Start grantees and their boards, that was uh, to make sure everybody was on the same page about it was more of a challenge than writing the agreement itself. But it also was very specific about which data points would be shared. And Janice, just to clarify, was that, did you have to go to each board separately or were, did you convene them we, together as a group. We convened as a Georgia Head Start Association. Not all boards required that we come. We went to about six boards just to do uh, an explanation for them to get their buy-in. And of course, they all came out at very positive once they understood. It was just a more at length uh, that, that some grantees needed. OK, and Karen, I know that you're not using data sharing agreement, agreements, but right. Katie, can you speak a little bit about um, 
what specific yeah. challenges there were in that process? So um, ours was not as simple of a process as George's was. Um, ours was um, very difficult and uh, took a long time. Um, it included coming up with the main body of language and having those actually working on the data committee coming to agreement on what components should be in there. And um, it includes um, security and, and research requests and all of that, as well as the HIPAA and FERPA required language. Um, and so I think the reason why it took so long is because once we came to agreement on what the actual content should be, then it was sent to all the programs participating to get their individual board approval. And so that took a while to accomplish. And then once all the approvals came back or requests for clarification were addressed or um, language changes were made because of concerns still, um, then it had to go through a legal process, which ensured the actual um, HIPAA and FERPA um, uh, re requirements were all in there accurately. And that took a really long time to, for us to get done as well. Um, so it took it was less than two years, but it was more than a year, <laughs> probably about a year and a quarter or a year and a half to get that agreement approved, once, legally approved once it all came. Um, to agreement on, and then we had to get it all signed by everybody, which also took a good chunk of time. So um, there's a lot of wordsmithing, and then a lot of um, approving that had to happen, and then a lot of people returning the actually signed agreements. And I, as a Head Start Collaboration Office Director during that time, was in constant communication with the programs about the agreements. I hand-delivered them if they needed to be hand-delivered. Um, I would go pick them up. Uh, you know, I did anything I could to get the programs to sign more quickly. So, okay, thank you. And I'm the last question, Karen. I'm gonna um, give to you. Um, one person had asked about what data fields are included in your longitudinal. What's and I think not exactly, but generally, what type of data is included in your longitudinal data system? Um, it's actually quite a bit of information, um, and I'd be happy to, to share um, some of the data dictionaries that we have that show the, um, the child level information uh, that's included, but pretty much everything that would be on um, a child's registration form um, is included within um, NJSMART. And then um, in addition to that, there would be uh, some teacher level information as well that relates back to each site. Uh, which is actually relatively new uh, for, for our NJ Smart system within the last um, two years or so. Um, but there are, it's actually there are a lot of different fields that go in. Um, and then obviously it expands over time um, once the child moves into um, kindergarten and beyond um, and starts to, to go into diff have potentially have different services available through the district. Um, but I'd be happy to share. Um, some of the um, the data dictionaries that we have for NJ Smart, they're all available on our website, and that would give a good sense of, of everything that's included. Okay, that would be great. Thank you guys for all of the questions uh, that you submitted. There were also some requests for copies of data crosswalks and other examples from states that presented um, that are available. So we will follow up with our presenters to see what information they have available and can share. And we'll get that information out to you um, with the copy of the webinar and the final slides for everyone. So I would just like to thank all of our presenters and attendees for your participation today. Uh, if you haven't already, you can access the policy brief, um, information from our previous state surveys, and individual state profiles on the Early Childhood Data Collaborative website. Also, if you'd like to subscribe to our listserv, um, you will receive any updates or new materials um, and hear about any other events that we will be hosting. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, Tom Schultz, who presented our brief, will be doing another presentation on the findings at the National Head Start Association Conference um, on April 1st in Washington, D.C. Um, and then I also wanted you to be aware of a new work group um, that has just opened up to new members um, as of March. 
uh, that will be discussing the need for resources to support the integration of Head Start into early childhood integration systems. Uh, and this is a work group that's being sponsored by the State Longitudinal Data Systems Grant Program. So as you can see on the slide, if you'd like to get more information about the work group um, or to join, uh, you can email Lauren Y. That's the email address listed. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the report um, or anything the speakers have shared, please feel free to contact any of us um, with additional questions. Um, as I mentioned before, we will be making the slides and the recording of the webinar available on the ECDC website next week. So thank you all for um, taking the time to speak with, to hear our presentation today. Um, we look forward to sharing more information with you all in the future. Thank you.